Good morning. Whoa, <clears throat> I think this is turned up. Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. Two microphones is not a good idea at the same time. Uh, you don't need me in stereo, do you? Uh, I want to welcome you to worship this morning. Did everybody get a song sheet on their way in? Because our uh, projection computer is not working today. So you should have picked up a song sheet on your way in this morning going to go a little lower tech this morning. So welcome to worship. The flowers here are uh, left from uh, the funeral so service of Rose Lumens. It, it's been kind of a, a tough week that way. We've, we've seen some people off to their eternal home. It's tough for us, but it's, it's wonderful for them, right? When we go in faith to the eternity that Christ has prepared us for. And really, every Sunday is like a little Easter. Every Sunday should be a resurrection day, a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. So will you, if you're able, stand and wish someone a warm welcome this morning? In Isaiah chapter 25, Isaiah says an interesting thing. He says, O Lord, you are my God, and I will exalt and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. We're going to think about God's sovereign oversight of, of everything in our worship this morning. But um, one of the places we see God's sovereignty in the most beautiful way is that way back in the day of Isaiah, he had a plan in motion to secure our redemption, a plan to show his grace to us by sending his son into this world. So uh, let's join together and sing, This is Amazing Grace. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. With truth and justice Shines like the sun in All of its brilliance The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my way
sing for all that you've done for me. Thank you so much for being the one who redeemed us. Thank you for taking us to this place by your grace today. We thank you that we may uh, gather before you and worship humbly and confidently because of what you've done for us in Christ our Savior. And uh, with the saints gathered in Revelation as you picture the future of your church, Lord, we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He! And together we sing. And
is, isn't it? Have you seen that this week? I know our kids have been spotting little bugs in the yard. And Yeah, go ahead and be seated. <laughs> and uh, Dennis told me on the way to church he saw an albino deer. Was that on the way to church this morning? Uh, all creation cries out the glory of God and uh, should turn our, our thoughts to the Lord. And uh, often it does, and sometimes we miss that. So every time we gather to worship is a reminder to open our eyes to everything that God is doing around us. We have, uh, not listed in our bulletin, but um, some special guests that uh, are, are not strangers to us at all, the Heisinga family, and uh, they're going to share uh, a song with us now as a ministry of music this morning. Thank you so much for your willingness to step in there. Thank you. Will the children come up for the children's message? Let's meet over here this morning. I've got something to show you that you've seen before. At least I hope you've seen it before. Anybody tell me what this strange stuff is? <laughs> it's a water bottle. It's just water, right? Yeah. We were talking about water one day at our house this week, and we were trying to decide if water is indeed the most thirst-quenching thing ever. 
What do you think? Is it? Water's pretty amazing, isn't it? I don't... That's good, yeah. Yeah, and sometimes people like to drink other things. Our big thing is, Dad, will you make us a malt? We don't do that very often. Malts aren't very thirst quenching. In fact, after I have a malt, I need, or a milkshake, I need some water, right? Some of you guys may be like, soda once in a while if you're like our kids it's not as often maybe as you'd like to have it sometimes people drink lemonade but a lot of the things that are thirst quenching are thirst quenching because they have water in them don't they we use water to make all that stuff and so who made water for us norman god, god did yeah you guys all knew that didn't you yeah. Do you know what Jesus said once? Jesus was trying to tell people what he is like. And in John's gospel, he uses a lot of comparisons of what he's like. He says, I am, and one of the things he said he is, I am the living water. And he told a woman he met once that people who have him never get thirsty again. He wasn't talking about how you feel on a hot summer day, but he was saying he is the most basic thing we need, right? Water is the most basic thing we need to quench our thirst. And Jesus is the most basic thing we need in our lives to give us what we thirst for spiritually. So the next time you have a drink of water, and I bet you will this week, because it's summer after all, think about Jesus. And think about his promise that when we have him in our lives, we have all we need. And we'll never thirst again for anything else that could satisfy us as much as Jesus does. Let's say thank you to him for that. And then if you plan to go to children's worship, Shannon is waiting for you right over there. Thank you so much, Lord, for being the living water. Thank you for telling us so many times in your word that when we know you, we have what we need most. Help us to believe that. And help us to remember, it's so easy to forget about you. Every time we take a drink of water this week, would you remind us that you came to be our living water? so that we could really know what it means to live in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, let's sing our praise to the Lord.
please be seated. And turn in your Bibles uh, to Genesis 50. I'll let you find that for a moment and then we'll pray that God will speak to us through it. Genesis chapter 50. Right at the end of the first book of the Bible. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we believe your word is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, not to hurt or destroy, but to bless your people and to give us the very things we need to hear most. And so speak to us, Lord, and help us to listen, help us to discern, help us to understand, help us to apply your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When you fear that the worst will happen, sometimes your mind can do strange things, can't it? When you live in fear? There was a city slicker from Chicago who was driving on a lonely country road in southern Wisconsin on a dark and rainy night, and he had a flat tire. He uh, reluctantly got out of the car, opened up his trunk, no lug wrench there. The light from a farmhouse could be seen dimly down the road. So he set out on foot in the driving rain. Surely the farmer will have a lug wrench he could borrow, he thought. Of course, it was late at night. The farmer would be asleep in his warm, dry bed, and maybe he wouldn't answer the door. And even if he did, he might be angry at being awakened in the middle of the night because it was really getting late. The city boy, picking his way through the dark, stumbled on. And by now his shoes and clothing were soaked. You know, even if that farmer did answer the knock, he'd probably shout something like, What's the big idea waking me up at this hour? What are you doing on my property? And that thought made the city boy angry. What right did that farmer have to refuse him the loan of a lug wrench? After all, here he was stranded in the middle of nowhere, soaked to the skin, that selfish farmer. What a clod. He had no doubt about that. The man finally reached the house and he banged loudly on the door. A light went on inside. A window opened above. A voice cried out, Who is it? His face was white with anger. He called out, You know who it is. It's me. And you can keep your lousy lug wrench. I wouldn't borrow it if it was the last one on earth. Well, maybe it never gets quite that bad, but sometimes what we think ahead of time determines how we relate to people, how we approach them, right? And I wonder if Joseph's brothers had a little bit of that going on in this passage in Genesis 50. Listen to this. I'm going to begin reading at verse 15 if you're following along. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us? Pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him. So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you're to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of God, of, your, of the God of your father. And when their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and for your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. 
they may have imagined the worst coming to Joseph. After all, they had betrayed him pretty badly. And, and now that betrayal resurfaces for them. They've just buried their father. They've been with their whole family about 17 years in Egypt. And now their dad has died. And 17 years ago, their brother forgave them. They thought, sort of, they hoped. And now they're beginning to wonder. You remember the story, right? The story of Joseph. We're kind of depending on that this morning. So let me recap it if I can in just about two minutes. There was a family with a whole bunch of brothers. And one of them, the youngest at the time, Joseph, was favored by his father. His father even made him a really fancy coat with lots of colors in it. And, and the brothers were jealous. And then Joseph had dreams. He had dreams that, that one day he would do something significant, something great. And they'd actually come and bow before him. You know, like the stars bow, bowing before a brighter star. And, and they didn't really like the sounds of that either. They, they really just couldn't stand him. They hated his guts. And, then, and they went away to watch the flocks and to take them uh, to some pastures that were further out. And they traveled a long ways away from home. And the father said to Joseph, go see how your brothers are doing. So he did. So uh, when Joseph discovered his brothers, he was the last person they wanted to see. And some of them hatched a plot, let's just kill them right here and we'll never have to deal with them again. We're a long ways away from home. One of them, a, a little more compassionate than the others, said, well, just, just wait a minute. Let's throw them in this pit and then we'll decide what to do. And along came a bunch of slave traders and uh, he talked the other brothers into just selling Joseph to these slave traders who were headed for Egypt. And, and so they sold their brother as a slave. Remember that? And then, and, and then to make up the story of why he didn't return, they took this beautiful coat he had, killed a goat or something like that. Was it a goat, sheep, whatever? And, and, and put the blood on the coat and uh, came back with the story to tell the father, oh, dad, boy, we sure don't want to upset you. And, and we hope this isn't what it is, but, but look what we found out here. Isn't this, isn't this Joseph's coat? Looks like he's been killed by a wild animal. And the father grieves his death. Doesn't go looking for him. He's surely gone. And Joseph ends up in Egypt, ends up slave in, a, in, in the home of a really influential and wealthy person. And, and, and he works himself up. He's so responsible. He's got such a good attitude. He, and, and, and God blesses him. And, and, he, and he rises to a place where he's put in charge of all kinds of things. And then Potiphar's wife had her eyes on Joseph and tried to get him to commit adultery with her. And, and, and he said, no, how could I betray this man that's been so good to me this way? And, and she says, fine, rape! And, and off to jail he goes. And there he makes friends with a couple mans, who, men whose dreams he interprets. And one of them is going to be released from prison. He's going to go back to serving the king. And Joseph says, when you do that, please remember me. Please plead my case. Please help me. And, and the man forgets all about him for, what, a year or something? And then finally, Pharaoh had a dream. Finally, Pharaoh had a dream and he couldn't figure it out. None of his Wise men could figure it out. And then the one who'd been in prison with Joseph said, you know, there was a guy back there. He could sure interpret dreams. And Joseph interpreted the king's dream. And he said, there's going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And you better store up during the years of plenty because it's going to be really bad during the years of famine. And you need to find somebody who can manage all this and figure it out for you so that you avoid disaster, O oh king. And the king thinks, who could better do it than this man right here, right? And all of a sudden, Joseph is number two in the land. And then when the famine does come, his own family are among the beggars that come looking for help. And they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. Plays some tricks on them finally, <laughs> reveals himself and brings the whole family to Egypt so they can survive. Strange how God works, isn't it? So now they're worried. You know, they left him for dead after all. They, 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 they let the father believe he was gone for good so no one went looking for him. And he went through all these problems because of these brothers. And Joseph has done nothing during the last 17 years to fan their fears. He, he's shown them only kindness. But it's not irrational that they would wonder, was he just biding his time? Was he just lying in wait for them, maybe till the old man dies? 
Or, or did he forgive him once, but now he's kind of changed his mind? Has anyone ever done that to you? Or, you know, maybe you've really done something to hurt somebody and it's all forgiven, but then it comes up again in a year or two and you, you thought it was gone, put to rest. You never know. And Joseph, being in power the way he was, has the opportunity to do a lot of hurt to them, to really pay them back. And so they concoct a story, at least that's the way I think we should read it, you know. Joseph, actually, you weren't there, but you know what? Dad's last dying wish was that you would treat us really good. And remember that we're forgiven here and, and, and don't take out any, any vengeance on us. Dad said, Joseph, last words. You know, actually we have pretty good reason to believe Jacob never learned the truth. And maybe he never heard the depth of, of what they'd done. And they come to Joseph with that story and Joseph says, don't be afraid. In fact, he says it twice, doesn't he? Did you catch that first? And then, and then in his last phrase, he says, he starts by saying, do not be afraid. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. And then he gives some reasons. And the reasons he gives aren't so much the reasons why, but the reasons how. How in the world is it that Joseph is able to do that? He's got a perspective. He's got a perspective we all need because we all get wronged. We, we're all betrayed at some point. And, and how are we going to forgive when forgiveness is so hard? Well, we need that perspective. So we get part of that perspective in verse 19. Part of Joseph's perspective is he says, there is someone who sits in judgment and it's not me. It's God. And it always has to be God. Am I in the place of God are the words that, that he speaks? Because what would they fear? They would fear that he would be in a place almost like God and he could do to them whatever he wanted to do to them. And he, but, it, but he says, that's not my place. As far as Egypt's government is concerned, maybe it's my place, but it's not my place before God. And they bring their full confession to him because finally, you know, finally they come clean about all that they've done because they feel as though they're facing their judge. And Joseph says, I'm not your judge. You able to say that to other people? See, he doesn't say that they didn't do wrong, right? The wrong is very real. And yet he has a perspective that says it's God's place to sort things out, not ours. He knew what he, who he was and he knew who he wasn't. And I'm thinking he probably knew that our sins, all of our, uh, you know, all of our sin is uh, worse than the things that, that we're accused of because it, it involves our thought life too. Jesus brought that out in Matthew 6 when, when he reiterated the Ten Commandments and, and got at the, the, the thoughts that give birth to sin. And, and every, every one of us, at some point deserves to be judged, right? At many points, actually. And so he says to his brothers, maybe something like this, you know, you guys, you've done a lot to, maybe he's thinking, you've done a lot to hurt me. I never saw my mother again. My dad thought I was dead for years. I sat in jail, you know. Um, I was left for dead. And now you're lying to me. I think he probably knew that, don't you? But he says, am I in the place of God? That's not between you and me merely. That's between you and God. That's between you and God. Are you able to say that to people when they, when they hurt you? To, to say, yeah, it is between us, but ultimately it's between God. And what they need more than anything is to be reconciled to him. And see, when you have that perspective, then you can step out of the, the seat of judge, right? When, when you realize that that's really where we all are and we all stand accountable to God. So let's leave it in His hands. It's between you and your Creator, He says. Between you and your covenant God. A lot of times we like to 
step into the place of God. People do that in so many ways. I mean, they reinterpret the Bible. There's something there that it doesn't jive with how I live. And so, well, that part was archaic and we can't really take that seriously anymore. So sometimes we, we put ourselves in God's seat by doing that, you know, by not honoring the authority of, of his word. Sometimes we um, put ourselves in the seat of God thinking that we are the solution to others' problems and what they need is our help. And... Uh, you know, we, we kind of overestimate our ability to save the world or, or to save our family at least. Sometimes we put ourselves in the place of God by worrying. Jesus said, don't, don't worry. Seek first the kingdom and, and all of the other stuff will be taken care of. And sometimes we put ourselves in the, in, in the seat of God by hanging on to grudges like Joseph was tempted to do. It can happen to all of us. And we need to remember that only God judges. Only God is in a position to judge. In fact, if, if Joseph had said otherwise, he might have allowed his brothers to sort of short circuit what they needed because if, if they were just looking to him and if, if, if he said, hey, it's all okay between us, they might never confess their sin to God. They might never really get the reconciliation that they needed. So when we're hurt and hurt deeply... Part of our perspective, part of the perspective that lets us forgive is to say, you know what, it's in God's hands. And I'm not even going to try to guess what God should do with this situation. I'm just going to leave it up to him because I believe that, that he's the one we're all accountable to. And then verse 20, in verse 20, the key verse really, right, of this whole passage, the key verse some people would say of all of Genesis is, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. We call that... Uh, a part of God's providence. We call that the sovereignty of God. That, and, and uh, you know, a lot of times people don't like to, to delve into the depths of that theology because it's theology afterward, uh, after all. But, but this is an example of where our theology really matters, where what we believe at the core determines how we live. And it is important how we understand God. And, and the message in Genesis 50 and throughout Scripture is that God is able to work positive results even from evil that's allowed. They had their plan and, and God had a plan and their plan didn't mess up God's plan. It's like Romans 8, 28, where, where, you know, Paul tells us all things work together for the good of those called according to his purpose. And, and we can see that in hindsight. And Joseph could see some of it here because Egypt had been, you know, spared and all of this. And we don't always see it, but the Bible teaches what theologians call concurrence. That, that though we act and make choices at the very same time, somehow God is acting and making a choice and God's choice prevails. And we struggle with that because if, if, if God is sovereign and God ordains everything that happens, then do we really have a choice after all? Well, yes, strangely we do. And yet our choices can't ruin the plan of God. And, and, and we, we have such a hard time putting that together. But it's a mystery that Scripture lays out there for us to accept and to believe. And Joseph... Through all the circumstances God took him through, I don't know when he, when he arrived at the place where he could say that, but by the end, he can say that. He can say, you meant it for evil, but you know what? God meant it for good. That really goes a long ways in helping us to forgive and to reconcile, doesn't it? I mean, not, not for a minute does he downplay what his brothers have done for him. You meant it for evil, guys. <laughs> Let's be honest about that. But God meant it for good. God sovereignly brings to pass what happens. Joseph believed that to the core of his being. And it's important to know what he, what, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say God missed something and you guys got away with something and then God woke up and, and came to my rescue. He doesn't say God came up with a plan B. He doesn't say God had a plan to deliver Egypt through me and you guys almost messed up God's plan, but God made it work anyway. No, he says, rather, God had a plan all along. It's a mind bender, isn't it? Some people have said that, that understanding God's choice, God's sovereignty, and our choices are, are like uh, 
you know, as impossible as understanding a couple of rivers that come together. If you can imagine being on the Mississippi and the Wisconsin runs into it and, and then downstream a mile try to sort out which is which. We can't. We just accept it. That by providence, God governs the universe. And when we do, it helps us to forgive. The Bible doesn't teach that if good things happen, God is good, and if bad things happen, then maybe He's not. The Bible describes a world in which sometimes terribly bad things happen, and yet God is good. And the question is, if we believe that, if we'll accept that, how do we live it? Maybe you've been hurt badly by someone. Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe, maybe you haven't seen the purpose in God allowing that to happen. Maybe you never will. We don't always get that glimpse. Are you able to turn those emotions over to His care? To say they meant evil and this is bad, but God is good? It's what enables Joseph to reconcile. So in verse 21, he's able to show grace, right? It says he spoke tenderly to his brothers. In fact, he even says to them, don't be so, don't, don't be so angry with yourselves. <laughs> he's telling them basically to forgive themselves. It's hard to come to that place, isn't it? It's part of what we pray when, we, when Jesus tells us to pray Deliver us from evil. We've got to learn to forgive as we're forgiven. And we do that also when we see the depth of God's mercy for us. Do you know this song? It's, there's a hymn called Depth of Mercy that says, Depth of mercy, can there be mercy still reserved for me? Can my God his wrath forbear me the chief of sinners spare? Now incline me to repent. Let me now my sins lament. Now my foul revolt deplore. Weep, believe, and sin no more. There for me the Savior stands, holding forth His wounded hands. God is love, I know I feel. Jesus weeps and loves me still. When you come to that place, when you see how gracious God has been to you, that enables you to speak tenderly when what people deserve is anything other than that. Because he knew that God was sovereign and good, Joseph could be humble and confident. And we look at that and some of us are thinking, that was Joseph. After all, he's this hero of faith. He's one of the patriarchs, Joseph. Maybe Joseph could do it, but I can't. I'm not sure I can. I'm not sure I'm a Joseph, right? Well, you know what the good news of the gospel is? Tim Keller says in a book he wrote about this text, among others, the news is you can do better than Joseph. Jesus said, referring to John the Baptist, whom everybody revered, that John was a great man, and then he said, and the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater. Why? Because they've experienced the outworking of God's grace at the cross of Christ. The cross of Jesus helps us to be humbler than Joseph and more confident than Joseph. You know, God has a plan for you too. Ephesians 1 uh, speaks of that plan beautifully, eloquently, and uh, in Ephesians 1 chapter 11 says this, or Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In Him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. And He did that through Christ who suffered more than Joseph. Right? When we have a hard time reconciling a good God with a, with, with, a, with a hurtful, evil world, we have to remember that the greatest sin ever committed ushered in the greatest blessing ever known. As Jesus Himself 
living the only perfect, fully loving life, was crucified. And that became blessing for all of us. It wasn't an end to God's perfect plan. It was part of God's perfect plan. And so this morning, as, as you think about Joseph, reaffirm your trust in a sovereign God. If you're suffering evil, if you haven't seen the purpose, can you turn to Him and trust Him based on who He has been for centuries? Will you pray with me? Lord, that You would make us more like Joseph. We see the rightness in that. We see the goodness in that. We see the folly of the brothers cover up lie from the grave, you know. And we want to be able to be like Joseph. No, we want to be able to be like Jesus. Help us. Remind us that you are the one who sits in judgment. Remind us that even in uh, the most perverted plans of people, you are working behind the scenes and you never cease to be in control. Help us to trust in that. And help us to remember that the most amazing outworking of your sovereignty was in showing amazing grace to us. Help us to rest in your forgiveness and help us to be your forgiving people. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue in prayer, um, a uh, prayer request for uh, Tina Blockheis. She's in the hospital. If you didn't get it on the prayer chain, I think that did go around on the prayer chain. Hopefully coming home soon. Uh, she's uh, receiving treatment for an infection there. And, uh, and, and obviously some families have had uh, some loss and, and grief this week and yet hope in, uh, in our Savior. What else? What other prayer requests do you have? Brad Bruner is at General Synod. We want to uh, remember Brad and the other delegates. They've still got a couple days here, a few days to go um, at our denominational annual meeting, um, making decisions on our behalf. And Amy Jansen is up in Hayward or wherever camping, but hurt her elbow and has some, what, like hairline fractures or something in there? Uh, so let's pray for Amy's healing. Others? Let's turn to God in prayer. Father in heaven, your name is above all names. And when we say, hallowed, holy, different, be your name, uh, part of that is to acknowledge that you're sovereign over all things. And that when, when we don't understand why you allow what you allow, it's because we just don't understand you. Help us not to doubt that you have a plan and a purpose. Help us not to doubt that you're able to orchestrate everything for good in this world that you govern. Help us, Lord, to leave to you the work of judging, even as we speak the truth about those who've hurt us. Father, thank you for providing for us so immeasurably, so richly, so many blessings in this life, so many wonders to behold. And as we've been reminded twice just this week, that this is just a, a flash, just a just a glimpse of an eternity that you're preparing for your own. Help us to believe in your love and grace at the cross of Calvary. Help us to know the assurance facing an eternity with Jesus as our Savior. Father, please continue to provide 
for us and help us to look to you for everything. Help us live dependently upon you and help us to give you glory and praise for everything we enjoy at your hand. Lord, we, we lift up some of the people that are dear to us and, and we think of Tina in the hospital and pray that you'd bring healing and strength back to her. We think of Amy and pray that you'd bring healing to her elbow. We do intercede for the delegates at RCA General Synod and, and CRC General Synod as, as they meet at Calvin College. We ask that you would guide the course of these denominations and help delegates like Brad to have wisdom in the decisions they they make and uh, the discussions they take part in. We pray that you would guide the rulers of the nations as well. We pray that somehow you would have your hand in uh, a meeting between our president and uh, North Korean leader. We pray that in, in many other situations that cause anxiety for us and give news reporters something to talk about that that you would show your sovereignty. We think of the many people affected by volcanoes and earthquakes in the last couple of weeks. And we pray that, that where there's that devastation that, that you would pour in help and where there's heartache and loss that, that you would draw people to yourself and help them to find hope in you. God, do help us to... Uh, Show your grace to others. And do spare us from temptation for your glory and your kingdom and your power is something we want to lift up. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think Joseph probably had to, to have this attitude to pray this kind of prayer. Have your own way, Lord. Humanly, there might have been a lot of other things he'd like to do, but he saw a God who was sovereign over everything and a God to whom he was accountable. And, and uh, he was willing uh, to say, let it be done the way you want it, Lord. You willing to say that to him? Let's, let's express that as we sing.
Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. May that be true of each one of us. May the grace of God in our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours in abundance. Amen. Thank you.